Hello, I'm Brett Moss, and you're watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. Our guest today is Dr. Antonio Betancourt. Dr. Betancourt is the Director of the Office of Government Relations for the Universal Peace Federation in Washington, D.C. He's also the Executive Director of both the Summit Council for World Peace and the Association for the Unity of Latin America. Dr. Betancourt is President of the World Institute for Development and Peace, which is dedicated to advancing economic justice and democratization. Antonio Betancourt and his wife, Kuyoko, have four children, and next year in July, they'll celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. Dr. Antonio Betancourt, welcome back to the Defining Moment. It's really my honor to welcome you here and uh, for our, another installment on our series in Addressing Global Issues. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to me to be here in Santa Monica. It's wonderful. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Our topic today is the role of religion in reforming the United Nations. After the United Nations was formed in 1945, the Soviet Union didn't allow any reference to God in its founding charter. Can the United Nations, in your opinion, fulfill its mandate for achieving world peace without allowing the full participation of religion and spiritual values, as well as religious and spiritual leaders in addressing global conflicts? Without the inclusion of religion in the format on how to address world problems, world dysfunctions, grievances, war, hunger, sickness, and so forth, uh, it can't. It has 60 years to do it, and it couldn't do it. They need to reform, and they need to include not just religions, you know, when you talk about religions, immediately you send all kinds of messages to the anti-religious uh, crowd out there, which are quite big and, and uh, active. What you need is a, a council with equal powers to the Security Council, composed of people that have grown in their love for humanity, from a religious perspective, they may not be religious themselves, some may be religious leaders, but from a religious perspective, the love of humanity transcends their own interest, their own religions, their own nations, their own concerns. A body that brings the wealth, the inheritance of world scripture, world religions into the midst of the UN. Explain to us your vision for how such a religious council would function within the United Nations. Well, um, first it has to develop. I don't know exactly how it will work, but what the UPF conceives is a council that will bring the spirituality of the nations, the, the essence of a spirituality of the nations into the discussions that will affect humanity. Peace, for example, war, hunger, disease, uh, population controls, etc., etc. To all these problems that the UN uh, needs to address and effectively work, especially world peace. You need a body of peacemakers, unifiers, harmonizers, people who understand the dynamics, the process of world unity, working together, people who understand the process and the dynamics of world harmony. Uh, explain to us. And, and, yeah. and the process and, and, and dynamics of world peace beyond religion, beyond nationality, beyond the interest of each specific state. You will have two chambers, one that look after the interests of each nation, 
represented by the government as it is right now. Yes. And you have another chamber that represents the civil society of the world, of all of humanity, through either people of conscience or religious leaders or people of spirituality who, whose life is a testimony of living beyond themselves, who understand humanity as a whole, who have a vision of a world of peace and harmony and unity that will affect all human beings, a person that is able to transcend their own narrow views or narrow interests of a particular race, a particular ethnic group, a particular uh, nationality, a particular country, all of that. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. How can the United Nations transcend the narrow-minded behavior of its representatives who are only concerned about advancing their own national interest? The UN has to reform and has to adopt a new set of values, perhaps not out of morality, not out of some ethical calling or moral, moral calling, but out of necessity because the world is, 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 is disintegrating. There is a possibility for the disintegration of nations completely because of the lack of, of, of coherence, the lack of political will, you may say, a lack of spiritual tools to bring peace to the world. Religions, for example, right now, instead of being mobilized been stimulated to bring unity, peace, and harmony has been mobilized by radicals, by fanatic groups within religions to uh, uh, foster violence, to foster animosity, to increase the re historical resentments and historical hatreds that ha characterize the relationship between individuals, ethnic groups, nations, races, religious, and so forth. We cannot allow religions to do that. We need to raise a new generation of people all over the world that see the UN as the home of all, of all humanity, as it, as it should be. But in order to, for the UN to be the home of all humanity, it has to have the values of a working, functional home, which is an understanding of the spirituality of the constituency of the world. You cannot just erase religion out of the picture just because the aspect of religion that can do harm is being activated by radicals and crazies out there, which is something that is not new. This has been going on since time immemorial. Sectarianism has been with us uh, the Christians did it, the Jews did it, the Muslims did it, the, 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 the Hindus, the, every, every religion has a history behind of sectarianism and violence based on sectarianism. But at the same time, every religion has universal shared values that call for patience, generosity, filial piety, peace, give to the other, sacrifice for the other. So that aspect of religion is the one that we need to stimulate and we need to raise a generation of people transcending nationalities, religions, races from all over the world. And the basis for that movement are there. Okay, great. Thank you. Tell us, what does the Universal Peace Federation mean by the term culture of peace? The culture of peace uh, is related to the culture of heart. In other words, peace in the truest sense is a peace within. It's not the absence of violence. It's not a truce between two, two parties who barely tolerate each other. That's not peace. It's the peace in the heart. When you carry no animosity, when you have been able to liquidate your feelings towards the enemy, the desire for revenge, the desire for domination, 
the desire to discriminate, the desire to, to fulfill the natural greed that we possess. Uh, we need uh, to create that kind of, that kind of uh, 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 movement that will move the UN to where it is now to what it should be. Now, the culture of peace is being carried out right now, or the culture of heart is being carried out right now by the UPF, the Universal Peace Federation. The Universal Peace Federation right now has 80,000 ambassadors for peace in 180 countries. Ambassadors for Peace come from the top and from the bottom. From all, from all levels of society. From all levels of society. Some serve their countries as presidents, as heads of state, or former presidents, ambassadors in the religious field. Some are in the sports, some are in academia, some are scientists, Nobel Peace uh, winners. Uh, some are, don't know how to read, Andre, uh, uh, are, are illiterates, and yet they're doing something good in communities around the world. The goal is to, in order to create a culture of peace, we have to create a number of individuals committed to the good of the nation equal to 30 times the number of legislators that a country has. So you're referring to the, quant the quantity of ambassadors for peace assigned to each nation, or, or appointed within each nation. Appointed which, 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 uh, within each nation, which is, as you said, I'm glad that you said appointed. It's not a recognition. It's not an award. It's an appointed for a mission mm. to what they should do for the sake of peace. Peace at, from the neighborhood or from the rural community, from the village, to the county level, to the city, to the state level, to the national level, regional, like the Western Hemisphere or the Middle East, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and eventually internationally and, and, and finally at the United Nations. So the Ambassador for Peace and the UPF is a program founded by the Reverend Samuel Moon. This is the culmination of Reverend Moon's 70 years of commitment to the work of peace in many, many fields. This movement of ambassadors for peace has taken upon themselves the creation of a culture of heart, the culture of peace, in which religions will play a pivotal role. Can you give us some, some examples of how this culture of peace uh, would transform different aspects of the societies in which we live? Well, first of all, let me talk in, the most, in, in, in a little more internal. Okay. Throughout history, humans have developed the abilities to, for the use of tools, technology. Mm -hmm. And they have developed the abilities to think rationally. Today we have almost a perfection stage of rationality and the use of machines and tools and, and, and technology and gadgets. But from the point of view of our capacity to feel empathy towards the other, sacrifice myself first for my wife and children, second for my community, third for the nation, fourth for the world, we are in diapers. We are totally underdeveloped. There are a few individuals out there in communities around the world, in 180 countries or the roster of the UN, which is 200, more than 200. There are individuals out there who work in the fields of religion, in the fields of academia, in the fields of politics, in every field, media, NGOs, women's issues, youth issues, sports, the arts, the business, few individuals, who are selfless. We call, them, and, we call them extraordinary people, or heroes and in the society. He, and the majority are invisible, mm. but they are the ones who make society function, mm. from the neighborhood 
all the way to the intergovernmental and international organizations, including the UN. We need a deliberate, systematic effort of educate the people of the world to educate the heart of the people. In other words, the capacity to love. Every human being, regardless of who they are, whether they are super educated or totally illiterate, they have a heart and they have a capacity to love. Some intensively, like Mother Teresa, like Albert Schweitzer, like Martin Luther King and Gandhi, some a little less, but we need a concerted effort that involves everybody, all the leaders, particularly in the fields of religion, who are the ones who talk about values, spiritual values. We have to move from rhetoric, thinking about good things and doing something else, into thinking and acting good and educating the world, adults as well as children, to live for the sake of others. An ethical system of, of, of character education that will bring the best of every human being all over the world. That is what ambassadors for peace are called to do all over the world. In theory, as well as in action in communities all over. So without changing the way humans are thinking right now, in which we have a system that glorifies greed to the, from, the, from the, the, the slightest to the extreme. We have a system that glorifies the dark side of nature. And we think that that's the way it should be, or that's the way it is. Human nature. Human, na fallen nature, mm. ugly nature of mm. humans. Mm -hmm. Well, we have an ugly, a shadow nature. We need to stimulate the capacity of people to feel empathy towards the other, all over the world. So we can create a culture, not a culture of death, not a culture of violence, not a culture of mine is mine and yours is mine if I can take it away from you, but a culture of peace, or I call it a culture of heart. Okay, now you talked about educating the world with these uh, character education values. Uh, how do you envision that actually taking place? Uh, actually, you know, 6.5 billion people on the, on the earth, how do you envision educating the world in these values? Well, the interesting thing is that within religions, there is a language that I call the language of heart, the language of the heart, that connects them all. And there is parochial, you know, sectarian beliefs. Every religion has a certain sectarian beliefs, but they also have universal shared values. That universality of beliefs of all religions, I call the language or the lexicon or a dictionary of heart. I'll give you an example. Fidelity, honesty, sacrifice, patience, fortitude. There is no two meanings of that word within the world of religions, regardless, the Hindus, the Catholics, the Protestants, the Jews, everybody agrees on the meaning of fidelity, the meaning of selflessness, the meaning of all these things that since time immemorial have allowed societies to come together within so-called contract, the social contract so they don't go at each other's throats. That part needs to begin to interact with each other. Mm. Put it on the side, the parochialism, the sectarianism. Put it on the side and focus on what connects them all together. 
that implies, of course, an agreement of what is worth saving. What is sacred for all? You know, what is essential for all? And based on that, create a movement that parallels the technological movement and the rationalistic movement of the world. So I understand you're saying that you see it as the role of religion to carry out this effort of educating humanity in these values. But, and yet, you know, these religions have been around for forever, for thousands of years in some cases. So something, does something, need, something needs to change or transform within the thinking and teaching of these religions? And, and if so, how do you go about uh, well, the, facilitating the, that? Well, the evidence shows that we have to do that not out of, not out of that we lo love each other, we like each other. We have to do it because we have no choice. We either learn to live together, prosper together in an interdependent with, with, with universal shared values and mutual prosperity, or we sink and hang each other. So you're talking about a new level of consciousness among religious leaders. that They would have to be willing out of no, necessity. No, it's, it's not just the religious leaders. Uh -huh. It's the communities around the world that includes religious leaders. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's the civil society okay. to the ambassadors for peace, and that's the beauty. Imagine if in the United States, right now we have 7,000 ambassadors for peace. Imagine if we have 100,000 committed people, you know, to love the neighbor, to love the country, not to judge, not the so-called the religious right or the liberal left. No. There is, <laughs> when you talk about real, real values, there is no left and right. There's just love. There's just values. If you have 100,000 ambassadors for peace committed, some come from the left, some come from the right, committed to the country and to the world. So it's not the religious leader. The religious leaders may contribute to this, and in fact, they can speed up the process. But whether they contribute, whether they agree or not, this is going to happen, because it's the will of God. God is tired of this disunity and this infighting between religions. Religions were created to really guard it, to rebind ourselves to the divine nature, the invisible divine nature, you know, that we lost because of the fall. This, all religions agree that there was some kind of a loss of paradise, some kind of loss of, of a state of innocence. Religions exist to bring people back to that state of innocence, not to fight with each other, not to say, I am better than you. That is history. Or my way or the highway. That That's right. That, that is the past. Uh -huh. Now, another reason is that the world is moving mm. towards the empowerment of the civil society. Why do I say that? Because as you look at the world, the world of today, November 11, 2006, is very different from the world of the past, in which people were intellectually dependent. They needed someone to explain the world. And it was only a few who portrayed themselves as no knowledgeables of the world. The majority needed someone to provide for their everyday life because they were dependent economically of someone. And they needed someone to explain the invisible world, wrong, right or wrong, to connect them with the incorporeal world. The world is marching towards the empowerment of individuals, in which the individual will know 
<laughs> the individual acquires his sovereignty intellectually, politically, economically, and religiously. So individuals will decide. And this educated civil society all over the world will put the government in place. And it will put the United Nations in place. Because they are no longer will tolerate all this nonsense that has gone, has gone on with the world for the last 10,000, 20,000 years. Who knows? OK, great. Very interesting. Thank you. What is the Universal Peace Federation doing to promote peace in the Middle East? We have brought more than 10,000 ambassadors for peace from all over the world who understand that peace in the Middle East is connected with the peace all over the world. If we let the things in the Middle East go out of hand, everybody will suffer. Look what's happening with Iraq. The consequences of that conflict in the Middle East how it, uh, it has affected the pockets just from one item, gas, in the gas stations all over the world. So the people understand that we have to help the Jews and the Palestinians to come together and resolve their grievances peacefully in a win-win situation. So the ambassadors for peace have said, here I am to contribute somehow to put pressure into the parties that are fighting and to bring support, spiritual support, moral support, and to show a vision of people living together. Because they, when the ambassadors for peace come to, 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 to Israel and Palestine and Jordan, they come from all religions. They're Jews, they're Muslims, they're Christians, they're blacks, they're yellow, from everywhere. That has created, has, has done a tremendous impact in the Middle East. Okay, fascinating. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're, we've run out of time for our interview today. Thank you so much for being our guest today on The Defining Moment. I'm really uh, grateful for your contribution to our program. Thank you for inviting me. Continue <laughs> inviting me. Okay. I'll happy to share my thoughts. Look forward with, to having uh, you back. With your audience out Thank there. Thank you so much, Dr. Betancourt. You've been watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. You can find us on the internet at www.definingmoment.tv. Thanks for watching and have a great day.